Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I am coming at you with a review of Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, which I recently read as a buddy read with Robert from Barter Hordes, and I debated whether or not I wanted to make a full video about this book because I didn't have as strong a reaction to it as I thought I was going to. I have enjoyed the Thomas Hardy books that I've read so far. I've read Tess of the Durbervilles, which I really liked, and Far From the Madding Crowd, which I loved, and I had heard Heard that this was one of his best novels, so when going into it, my expectations were pretty high. And ultimately, I found it to be a really fascinating and thorough denunciation of Victorian society and Victorian morality, but it was also a punishingly bleak read. Spoiler alert, this book is like a real drag, but I do think there are a lot of interesting things to discuss with regards to this book, and I want to touch on some of the themes and critiques that I really admired, and then I can get into some of the issues of pacing and narrative that kind of made this a slog to get through. So in case you don't already know, Jude the Obscure tells the story of Jude Folly, who is an orphaned boy of meager means but overflowing ambitions, who decides at a young age that he wants to transcend his working class origins and become a scholar and live a life of the mind in the nearby city of Christminster, which Thomas Hardy modeled on Oxford. So while he's working and making his way as a baker and then Later, as a stone cutter, Jude is spending his evenings and all of his free time pursuing a course of self-study. But when he is seduced by a local girl named Arabella and makes an ill-advised and short-lived first marriage to her, his grand plans are kind of knocked off their course and by the time he actually makes it to Christminster, he is met with the impenetrable walls of the university and finds that the gateway to higher education is closed to him. Jude realizes quite quickly that no matter how many hours he has devoted to self-study, it can never stack up and compete with these young men of privileged backgrounds who have been enjoying a formal education all their lives. And I think that the first frustration of Jude's intellectual ambitions is one of the most affecting narrative threads in the book. There's a particularly vivid scene when Jude first arrives in Christminster and is wandering the streets of the city at night, and he can see and feel the sort of spirit and presence of all these thinkers and philosophers and intellectuals who wandered those streets in the decades and centuries before him, and you can feel how thrilled he is at the idea that he's inhabiting the same space as these great men and that he's walking the same pathway that they once walked. And to see that excitement and ambition extinguished and to see him realize how naive he's been is crushing. What stings the most for Jude isn't the sense that he has failed, but the realization that he never really had a chance to succeed in the first place. And that is an injustice that leaves a bitter taste with him for years after the fact. But within his harsh critiques of class disparity and education and inequality of opportunity in Victorian society, Thomas Hardy also takes the time to extol the virtues of the working class and to extol the virtues of labor and the real lives of ordinary and obscure people like Jude. After spending a night in a pub and then finding himself at a particular crossways in the city, Jude reflects what struggling people like himself had stood at that crossway, whom nobody ever thought of now. It had more history than the oldest college in the city. It was literally teeming, stratified with the shades of human groups who had met there for tragedy, comedy, farce. Real enactments of the intensest kind. He began to see that the town life was a book of humanity infinitely more palpitating, varied, and compendious than the gown life. And I found reflections like that quite beautiful and moving despite Hardy's bleak pessimism throughout most of the rest of the book. The other silver lining of Jude's time in Christminster is that he meets his cousin Sue Bridehead, whom he soon falls in love with, and those two are really people who share a natural affinity for each other, and they're often described as being the same person, or two halves of the same whole. But their relationship is complicated by the fact 
that Jude is already technically married to Arabella, although she has long since ditched him for Australia, and it's complicated later by Sue also making an ill-advised first marriage. And what follows is basically a tangled web of marriages, divorces, living in sin, attempts at second marriages, and Hardy's critiques of the ways in which the institution of marriage in Victorian society corrupts real and true love and intimacy. And Hardy is really at his most unforgiving in his depiction of how punishing Victorian attitudes towards marriage, sex, and morality can be. Jude sleeps with a girl in his youth and then has to marry her and has his life plans sidetracked because of it. Sue's first husband makes what on a human level is the compassionate decision to let her leave him, and because of it he is ostracized by the people around him and loses his job. And for Sue, and for women in that period in general, sex and marriage are both a means of survival and damnation. Prior to marriage, girls and women in the Victorian era weren't supposed to have sex or have any sense of sexuality whatsoever. And then immediately after getting married, which most of them had to do in order to survive economically, they're expected to have sex with their husbands even if they don't want to, which is a problem that Sue bumps up against in her first marriage. And even when she frees herself of that marriage, she finds it difficult to be intimate with Jude, who she loves, because she doesn't necessarily want to get married again, but she also doesn't feel comfortable sleeping with him because it's technically quote-unquote wrong. And I think Sue can be kind of a difficult character because she is both impulsive and indecisive and is generally pretty capricious, and at times I found her monumentally frustrating. But I think that upon reflection, her aversion to intimacy and her inability to legally commit herself to Jude is a painful illustration of the ways in which the rigidness of Victorian morality really prevents people from loving freely and truly and prevents people from developing a healthy attitude towards sex or a healthy sense of their own sexuality because there is so much guilt and shame associated with it, especially for women. And it's really sad to see the ways in which the real love between Jude and Sue is complicated and in some ways ruined by the ever-present and looming judgments of society. And I have to say, without getting into explicit spoilers, Sue's last appearance in the novel is nothing short of devastating, and the way in which she ultimately surrenders herself to what is expected of her feels almost like a death. Tied up in these questions of morality, there is also a pretty explicit critique of religion. At the start of the book, Jude is a fairly religious person, a man of faith who regularly reads the Bible, and Sue is more of the renegade figure who rejects the institution of religion. But as the book goes on, there's a pretty interesting reversal in which Jude, who is constantly being worn down by life again and again, responds to those disappointments by turning away from his faith. Whereas Sue, after being struck with unimaginable tragedy, responds by placing all of her faith in religion. But Sue's turn toward religion seems to come from a place of guilt and utter devastation and emotional instability than from a place of any true religious feeling. And on the other hand, Jude's loss of faith is a loss of faith not only in religion but also in society and the world as a whole, and in that way it really feels like the ultimate rebuke on Hardy's part. It's pretty wild to read this and think that like it was published during the Victorian era and you can see why people had a negative response to it at the time and sort of the awkward ways in which Hardy is sort of straddling the Victorian and modern eras with this book. And so on those levels, 
Gospels, I found this book fascinating, and at times I found the relationship between Jude and Sue quite gutting and heartbreaking. But I also felt like this book really dragged, and I think a lot of that had to do with issues of pacing and structure. This book almost feels like two stories in one, the first part dealing with Jude's frustrated intellectual ambitions, and the second part of the book dealing with the doomed love story between Jude and Sue. And because of that, the pacing feels a little bit off. The first third of this book or so felt like it really dragged and felt like it was quite slow, and then Jude's kind of dreams and ambitions burst fairly early on in what is a 400 page book, and after that it almost feels like the book starts over again with the story of Jude and Sue, and then there is an appearance of a very ominous figure kind of late in the narrative, and that person is kind of there and gone in 60 pages in a way that feels very abrupt. It felt a little bit all over the place and like it would slow down a lot and then speed up and slow down again, so I didn't love that aspect of the book. I think the other reason that this book felt like more of a slog than some other Victorian novels that I love is because it didn't have quite as much of that peripheral commentary and insights that make an otherwise dense text something to savor. It didn't have those kind of wonderful and insightful internal monologues that you might find in a Charlotte Bronte novel, and it didn't have the sort of sharp and witty social commentary that you might find in a book like Middlemarch. On a slightly different note, I also found the character of Arabella, Jude's first wife, to be a bit of a caricature. She's painted as being quite conniving and unfeeling and grotesque. She's just a false and deceitful woman. Sue was also a character who was a little bit underwritten for me. There is a lot that is elusive about her decision making and her kind of quick changes of mood, and I often found myself wondering what exactly it was that she wanted wanted or what she was thinking. In many ways I thought ironically that her first husband Phillotson was a more richly drawn and nuanced character than Sue was, and although my heart ached for her and I felt myself kind of overflowing with sympathy for her, I still didn't feel like I could fully like see her. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Jude the Obscure. If you have read this book, I would love to know what you think about it, whether you liked it or didn't like it, or if you have some insights that I may not have gleaned while reading. In general, I'm glad that I read this book and I appreciate it, although I didn't fully enjoy the reading experience and it's not like a new favorite. But I would love to discuss it more in the comments below if you have thoughts on it or on Thomas Hardy or Victorian society in general. As always, thanks so much for watching guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye!